After just two starts, the Atlanta Braves have seen enough for Michael Soroka as they option him back down to AAA. Was that the right decision? We'll discuss that and more on today's episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, welcome back to Lockdown Braves, part of Lockdown Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Also, make sure you check out my written work over at bravestoday.com. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at Lockdown underscore Braves. Send in any questions, comments, or feedback that you have for the podcast. If you're new and watching on YouTube, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. And if you are watching there, hit that thumbs up button as well to help support the show and thank you so much for making lockdown braves your first listen of each and every day and thanks to some of my new everydayers out there we have asaf shiloh gary gibson docs card not a new everydayer but appreciate you doc as well benjamin hodge ecuadorman simba the scottish lion so we have a simba and a lion as an everydayer now as well and david mcintyre thank you so much to all my everydayers out there Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. This is our Taco Tuesday episode. Going to talk about the biggest stories from the Braves country right now. And it was an off day, but Braves gave us plenty to talk about as they optioned Michael Soroka back to Gwinnett. So we'll spend a good part of today's podcast discussing that wasn't the right move what do we need to see from Soroka before they bring him back up and what's the next plan in the starting rotation also want to continue a conversation that I somewhat started on Monday's episode about Von Grissom and what his long-term future and impact looks like with the Braves is his future with the Braves or do we see him get dealt at the deadline and then we'll set you up uh, with the Mets series starting this week as well we'll preview that But let's start with the story of the off day, and that was the Braves optioning Michael Soroka after a rough start on Sunday. Just two starts, and the Braves have sent him back to AAA. Now, this news, as you might have seen if you follow me on Twitter, we had some good conversations. We also had uh, some Braves fans that just wanted to be irate and not really bring any thing positive to the conversation yesterday, but this caught me off guard, and I think it caught a lot of people off guard with them optioning Soroka after just two starts. Now, on the surface, yes, they weren't great starts by any means, but why bring him up in the first place was kind of my first thought. If you were going to pull the trigger so quick after two starts, you had to know there were going to be struggles with Soroka, who hasn't pitched in a big league game in two and a half years. You had to know there were going to be some of these struggles. And if you weren't, willing to kind of let him work through that at the big league level I don't understand the decision to bring him up in the first place yes he was better over his last three starts at AAA and I guess he checked some of those boxes they wanted to see when he threw over 90 pitches in an outing but it's not like he was overly dominant at AAA and I think part of it was just that there were no other options at the time Obviously, Dylan Dodd wasn't getting it done. They probably wanted to see A.J. smith Shaver at least get a start or two at the AAA level. But I guess what really surprises me about the decision is that the Braves were very clear that they weren't going to bring Soroka up unless they felt like he was here to stay. And again, maybe what they saw in those two outings you know, changed that and thought that he wasn't ready to stay and they weren't willing to let him work through some of those mechanical issues and some of the problems he was having with his command at the big league level. But again, the front office was very adamant in saying they wanted to leave him in AAA as long as they did. And perhaps it should have been even longer because they wanted to know that when Soroka came up, he was going to get a real shot in this rotation and be here for a while. And after two starts, that's not the case. And he was optioned. I, Look, I get it, and I get everybody on, on Twitter who's telling me he wasn't good, he wasn't good, his stuff wasn't good, he's not ready. I, I get it. I hear you. My thing is, why not give him at least one more start? You had a, an opportunity to give him a start against the Nationals. You know, 
can't take anybody lightly, but it's a lineup where perhaps you could see him continue to work on those things at this level and perhaps set him up for some more success there. Because for me, when I look at these two outings, I thought the one in Oakland, he showed a lot of promise. And yes, you can say the lineup wasn't nearly as good, but I'm just talking about the stuff. And I think a lot of people just look at that line in Oakland and see he gave up four runs to one of the worst teams in baseball and think that that outing was just a complete dud and disaster. For me, that's not the case. If you if you watched it and even if you look at some of the analytics after, he didn't get hit particularly hard in that game. I thought his location on his breaking pitches were a lot better. He was still leaving the fastballs up a little bit, but I thought the command of his slider was much better and the changeup was a much more effective pitch for him. So for me, it was one okay start against a bad team, and it was one pretty bad start against a really good team. I would have preferred to see him get one more start against the Nationals lineup where he could have had the potential to have a little bit more success and then decide from that point. If you still weren't seeing the command come from the, the secondary pitches, then yeah, send them back down. Let them continue to work on those things. But Braves felt that wasn't necessary, that they had seen enough. So why... Why did they do it? Plain and simple. It's what you were all telling me on Twitter yesterday. He wasn't great, and I, I get that. But again, my, my, I go back to my point is you knew there were probably going to be those struggles when you called him up. I, again, I do think the, the start in Oakland was somewhat promising. Maybe the competition had something to do with it. The command uh, of his changeup and slider were better in that one. They were completely gone in the start against the Diamondbacks, and it's why they were able to just key in on his fastball and that lineup is too good to become a one basically a one pitch pitcher especially when you keep leaving that sinker and fastball up in the zone so i get it he, he wasn't good his fastballs were getting absolutely crushed the braves are committed to winning now and this is ultimately why they made this decision they felt like they have other options we'll talk about that here in a second that give them a better chance to win now than michael soroka and i respect that and i think that's probably the right decision do you know those other options are going to be better than what Soroka could potentially give you? They feel that. I don't know if I feel that quite yet, but that's what they feel. And I'm never going to be upset at a front office that's making a move to set your team up with the best chance to win now. And you got to feel like that's what the Braves are doing with not with, with making this decision now and sending Soroka down and going with potentially AJ Smith Shaver. Again, we'll talk about it more in a second to fill that role. Braves, you know, Braves can't afford to let Soroka continue to work on these things at the big league level if they just feel like it's way off. Again, I don't know how far off he is. For me, it's all just about the command. But, again, if you weren't seeing that at AAA, why call him up in the first place? Again, I, I think it's just basically there were no other options and they felt like they had to bring him up at that point. So, I understand it. It's all just kind of a tough situation. There's the the personal fan part of me too that just really wants to see Soroka succeed, and I'll I'll admit that I'm letting some of my fan emotion get in the way here because I want to see Soroka continue to compete at the big league level, and I want to see him continue to grow and get better. So I, I will admit there's some fa a fan side of me here that's just really rooting for Soroka, and I want to see him get that opportunity. But again, Braves did this because what they saw in Soroka, they don't feel like it's giving their, the team a best chance to win now, and they feel like they have other options that can do a better job of giving them a chance to win. So never going to fault an organization for doing that. So what's next for Soroka? Again, I've talked about it. For me, it, it's honestly just finding that command. Specifically with the slider, he's got to be able to get that slider over for strikes. That's a really key pitch for him. And a lot of you were pointing out the lack of swings and misses, especially against the Diamondbacks game. He had 11 whiffs in the, against the Oakland A's, which is a fine number for him. Soroka's not a big whiff guy anyway, not a big swing and miss pitcher. He was 26 percentile in whiff rate back in 2019. He's not a big swing and miss pitcher, so it's not necessarily a stat you can point at, but it does tell you who wasn't really fooling anybody against the Diamondbacks. He had just two whiffs there. But no whiffs at all on his slider, which is his money pitch. He's got to do a better job, I think, of throwing that slider in the strike zone because, as I said, especially against the Diamondbacks, hitters were just spitting on that pitch. One, because he wasn't locating it well, but you know, also just because you know they knew they could sit on that fastball 
And again, he's leaving it up in the zone and it's getting absolutely crushed. So again, that to me is the biggest thing for Soroka that he needs to work on is being able to get that slider over for a strike. It still has some good tight downward break on it. But again, if you're not going to be able to show that you can throw it for a strike, hitters are just going to spit on that pitch and wait on the fastball, especially at the big league level. So for me, that's the biggest thing for him. He just needs to prove that he can do that consistently enough. And then I think we'll see him back up. But that sinker slider combo is what made him so effective in 2019. And it's just, it's not there right now because of the lack of command. You look at the pitch movements, and I tweeted this out on Monday as well. As far as the horizontal movement, side to side movement, all of those are pretty much the same from what we saw for him from Soroka previously. The one thing that has diminished a little bit is the lack of drop on some of these pitches, and that's specifically troublesome with the sinker. Part of it could be the mechanical changes that he made has just affected that a little bit. I think it's also the fact that, again, he's leaving those pitches up in the zone, which could be you know, just not being able to find that release point with his new mechanics that he's using. But you leave singers up in the zone, they tend to flatten out anyway. But there is a significant – I wouldn't say significant, but it is a pretty good drop on the vertical movement on his pitches compared to where he was in the past. So I think that's something you have to look for as well in his upcoming starts. But again, if he can get that back, I still think there's plenty enough here for him to be a good pitcher at the big league level. Just need to see more consistency, especially with those secondaries. So who is up next? You have to imagine that A.J. smith Shaver gets the next shot. And I want to be very, very clear. And if you're an everydayer like those I mentioned at the top and others, you know how much I love A.J. smith Shaver. I've had him, you know, he's my top rated prospect in the Brave system coming into the year. I don't think there are many other outlets where, who are as high on him in that regard as I have been. So, you know, if you're an everyday listener, how much I love A.J. smith Shaver. I'm a little skeptical about just handing him this spot in the rotation Right now, I would have preferred to see a couple of more outings from him and the bullpen to continue to, um, you know, get his feet wet and get more acclimated to the major league environment before giving him a shot in the rotation. But don't get me wrong, I'm going to be locked in and super excited if he does get that opportunity because, again, I am very high on him and I'm excited to see what he can do. It just seems a little rushed. Everything about AJ Smith Chauver this year seems just a little bit rushed. So if they are handing the keys over to him, I hope it works out. And again, I love AJ smith Shaver. I, I know he can. I know he has the stuff to do it, but he's 20 years old. He barely has any professional innings under his belt. It, it just seems a little bit rushed to me. But again, can't wait to see it if that's the way that they go. Dylan Dodd could technically come back on Saturday. I can't imagine that he's the answer with how bad he has been at both levels really this year. Maybe they call Derek Rodriguez back up and use him as an opener, I think he would be available by that time. Maybe they use A.J. smith Shaver as somewhat as an opener, let him you know, go four, three, four innings, and then kind of bridge the gap to the back end. Uh, or you go with Munoz, who the Braves called up on Tuesday morning. I don't think they'll do another straight-up bullpen game, like having Jesse Chavez or Colin McHugh start. I just can't see them doing that again. Uh, it's Again, it seems like they're putting a lot on a 20-year-old in this spot to solve a what's been an ongoing issue all year for the Braves and finding that fifth starter with some of these injuries. Hopefully in a month from now, we'll be talking about the return of Freed and it won't really matter too much. But again, it just seems like a lot that they're putting on AJ Smith Shaver this year at 20 years old. Um, but we'll see what happens. Maybe they go with Alan Winans as well. We talked about him on yesterday's Miners Monday podcast. He has been great. Ed Gwinnett. Perhaps they open up room for him on the 40-man roster and give him an opportunity. I don't want to count that out as well, but it does seem like everything's pointing towards A.J. smith Shaver getting a start in the rotation. Next, I want to turn our attention to Von Grissom. Another kind of hot topic item on Twitter here lately. What is the long-term future with the Braves or without the Braves for Von Grissom? We'll discuss that here next. Buying tickets to your favorite event shouldn't be stressful, and it's not when you use Game Time, which is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They have great deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, so you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting excited 
for all the fun you're going to have. And just like I did on opening day for the Braves when I jumped on the Game Time app last minute and was able to find the cheapest parking tickets available. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. And the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Get images of the seat before you buy. I love that feature. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. The Braves and Mets play tonight at 7.20 p.m. Eastern, kicking off a three-game series between the division rivals. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search Braves. All right, if you missed yesterday's episode, it was a Miners Monday episode, so make sure that you do go back and give that a listen. Uh, really good stuff there. Really excited to see what David McCabe and Cedric D. Grand Prix continue to do at Rome. They're off to good starts there. And then we'll have our typical segments coming up the rest of the week. We'll have our stat of the day Wednesday, which hopefully will be a good stat from uh, Tuesday's game against the Mets. And then we'll have our through the league Thursday and mailbag Friday as well. So looking forward to that the rest of this week. But want to continue our discussion today talking about the future for Vaughn Grissom and I tweeted his AAA numbers out the other day and was you know, just really pointing out the fact of how good he's been at AAA this year with the bat. Wasn't really trying to say anything else other than that. And I was really taken away by some of the responses I got to that tweet. 31 total responses to that tweet. Nine and a half of them were in reference to his trade value going up. So basically, you know, at least nine to ten people wanting to trade him. Eight people responded and said, what about the defense? So you had another eight people who were just curious or worried about the defense. You had five people who say that he's a 4A player and is just terrible in general, which is just surprising. You had a couple saying that he needs to replace Ozzy, which was an odd one as well. And you had one, and I think it was one person. I'm not really sure by the response, but it seemed like they were in favor of keeping Von Grissom. So, this is the guy who was really big for the Braves last year, seemed like a fan favorite, everybody in love with him, and it's just crazy how things have completely gone 180 since then where almost hardly any of the fan base wants him around, most want him traded, most thinks he's absolutely done defensively. He'll never be a good defensive player. Some even thinking he's just not a good player in general, that he's a 4A player, and you know, very few people – wanting to actually see him stick around. And I'm not saying that these people are wrong. I just think it's, I think it's kind of crazy. The 180 that Braves fans have done on Vaughn Grissom. So what is his future? I've maintained this throughout the off season and I still believe it. I think his ceiling is a Chris Taylor type of player. Somebody who can play all over, maybe be average defensively at, at a couple different positions and be a solid hitter. I, I do believe in the hit tool. Um, but I think that's his ceiling is a Chris Taylor type, you know, super utility type of player. I don't know that he's ever going to field well enough to be an everyday shortstop at the big league level. He is just 22. Again, I've maintained that throughout the season. I'm not ready to give up on that, but we need to see some big improvements. Obviously just the, the eye test with what I saw in spring training and what we've seen so far this year. It's not, great the mechanics don't look very good and it just obviously the errors are coming as well as he made several of those when he was up filling in for Orlando Arcia so I don't know that he'll ever become an everyday shortstop I think they have to make a decision on that pretty soon because again I think the bat is ready and I think you're gonna have to find ways to get him in the lineup whether that's going to be DH or you just kind of move him around but I do think the hit tool is there. I think he's somebody that can hit 270, 280 with a 320, 330 on base, double-digit home run power, double-digit stolen base threat. Perhaps a, a Whit Merrifield type of player, but with not quite as much speed, not the stolen base potential. But I think he can be that at the plate and be that type of hitter. And again, I don't just want to give up on that. Um, you know, if they do decide that he can't be an everyday player defensively at shortstop, then I hope we start to see them 
work him into the outfield. I don't know that that happens this year. I, you know, I've said from the beginning, I think you give him this year to see if he can make that growth. But, you know, we get to the final two months of the season and the team determines that they're really not seeing that defensive growth from beginning to end. Then maybe you have to, you know, you do have to go ahead and make a decision on what to do with him defensively long term. You do have the DH, and I know it's not a typical DH profile, but if the bat is good enough, you can have him DH some. You can have him give guys in the field a day off every now and then if the Braves ever decide to give players in the field a day off every now and then. I just think there's still a role for him. I mean, to have a player like Von Grissom to give you that depth, whether you know, it's coming up from AAA or just coming off the bench as a utility player at the big league level, I still think there's real value in that. All that being said, I you know would not hesitate to trade him, uh, whether it's this trade deadline or in the offseason to come, if it's to make a significant upgrade somewhere else. I wouldn't just give him away. I, again, I still think there can be a role for him on this team, but I think if there's a big move to be made, you know, whether that's to to get an everyday bat or to get a you know solid mid-rotation starter. And I think if you're gonna give it on Grissom, I think they have to have at least two years of control left. No more trading for Joe Jimenez of the world who have one year of control and you give up one of your top hitting prospects. No more of that, but I'm not against trading Von Grissom in the right move. Again, it would have to be a, a significant piece that has control. But I wouldn't hesitate to move them in the right deal. You know, if you look on, and I've said this as well throughout the offseason, I think he is your best trade chip right now in Von Grissom. So if there is a significant move to be made, I think he likely is going to have to be part of that and should be part of that. You look at baseball trade values, which you know isn't always an accurate indication of a, a player's trade value, but you look at that site and Von Grissom does have the highest trade value of any of the Braves, you know, non-starters right now on the big league roster. You have the trade value of 20.2. That's 11th highest on the team overall, counting everybody. And, you know, it's more than any current prospect the Braves have. A.J. smith Shaver is second or is next highest at 15. So, again, if a, a significant trade is going to be made this season or in the offseason, I think Von Grissom has to be a part of that. And I'm, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. But I do think he has value on this team long term as a utility replacement type player. I don't know if he ever reaches an everyday status, but I do think the bat will play at the big league level. So that's our current update on Von Grissom. I'm sure it's not the last time we'll talk about it, but did want to spend at least a little uh, time discussing it as, again, I was a little surprised by some of the responses that I got from that tweet on Twitter. All right, next, we'll talk about a couple of more transactional moves the Braves made on Monday and Tuesday, and then I'll set you up for game one of the Mets series. We'll do that here next. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need for, from yourself. But when we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash MLB today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash MLB. We mentioned the Soroka news, him getting option. Uh, the Braves also picked up infielder Luke Williams, who was cut loose by the Dodgers uh, to, to make room for him on the 40-man roster. The Braves moved Max Freed to the 60-day IL. Nothing really changing there for Max Freed. He's still eligible to come back on July 5th. You know, it's still about the timetable we were all kind of expecting. So nothing really major, you know, nothing has changed as far as Max Freed's, you know, return. Um, but just needed to put him there to make that room on the 40-man roster. Still think it's probably around the All-Star break when we see Max Freed come back. Uh, Luke Williams, he's plays pretty much all over the place, slash 234, 291, 306, and 141 
big league games, but another guy who has big league experience and can play all over the field. And then on Tuesday morning, mentioned this earlier, the Braves are bringing up Rodery Munoz, 14 games at AAA, 4.63 ERA, 1.59 whip, 23 and a third innings, 21 hits, 16 walks, has really struggled with command, 21 strikeouts, but only one earned run allowed in his last six outings, and he's gone multiple innings in five of those. So a guy to bring it up, which you know I've met, I've talked about him before. I like the long term value of Munoz as a bullpen piece, but I don't know that he's necessarily earned it with his performance this year. Um, but I think he's just up for a couple of games until the Braves perhaps need to call somebody up this weekend. I just think he's there. If you need uh, somebody to give you some innings and a mop-up duty out of the bullpen, hopefully the Braves are up so big on the Mets in one of these games that you can throw Munoz out there for an inning or two to save the bullpen. But I don't expect him to become a big part of this bullpen or really be here very long. But that was the move. Uh, the corresponding move with them optioning Michael Soroka. On Tuesday night, it's game one of the Mets and Braves. It's Carlos Carrasco versus Bryce Selder. Carrasco this year, six games started, 5.74 ERA, 31 and a third innings pitched, 30 hits, 13 walks, 19 strikeouts. But he's been really good in his last two outings. I feel like I say this a lot now when Braves are facing starting pitchers, that every time the Braves are facing them, they seem to be on a good roll. But Carlos Carrasco is 12 and two thirds innings in his last two outings, 11 hits, just three walks, two earned and eight strikeouts pitched twice against the Braves last August, eight innings, eight hits, two walks, six earned three home runs and seven strikeouts. So hopefully the Braves continue to have some success off of him for Bryce Elder. I actually, maybe I'm going to jinx him here, but I kind of like him in this matchup. If he continues to pound the strike zone. And again, I say this every time you face this Mets team, Make them beat you. Make them string some hits together. So with the way Bryce Elder usually works, he's pretty efficient throwing pitches in the strike zone with a lot of movement, creating weak contact. I think that's a good recipe against this Mets lineup, especially if you can keep the ball in the ballpark and don't let Pete Alonso beat you with a two- or three-run homer. I really like Bryce Elder in this matchup. So hopefully I didn't jinx him there. But the Braves, you know, would obviously be great to win the first game of a three-game series against the Mets, but you do have Scherzer and Verlander coming up. The Braves do have Morton and Strider matching them in those two games, but it would be great to get this one as you have Bryce Elder, MLB's ERA leader, going up against Carlos Carrasco in game one. If you want to know more about this series and get prepared for it, I did write an article over on Braves today going a little bit deeper into uh, the series matchup if you want to go to Braves today and check that out. But it is the Braves and the Mets on Tuesday night at 7.20 p.m. Eastern. It again will be the MLB ERA leader, Bryce Selder, on the mound against Carlos Carrasco. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search Braves. That will do it for this episode of Locked On Braves. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On underscore Braves. You can follow me at shortstopball. Also, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast, and we will talk to you next time.